Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Open Community Forum COVID-19 Technology and GIS Hot Wash Part 2. Uh, it is 2 o'clock, and we'll be getting started with today's Hot Wash session. So just a, a quick overview of our agenda for today. We're going to start with some introductions and opening remarks, uh, followed by a keynote on intelligence-led pandemic plans from preparedness through response and into recovery. And that will be followed by a series of community stories, starting with a state level vignette from Oregon on using GIS and analytics to inform statewide response in COVID-19. And that will be followed by a federal and multi-state regional uh, vignette on leveraging technology to support decision-making on fatality management, medical supplies, PPE, and in monitoring social activity. And that will be coming from FEMA Region 1. And the last vignette in our series of community stories will be a local and regional uh, scenario around automating and integrating medical healthcare capacity data reporting and analysis in real time coming out of Colorado. And following the community stories, we'll actually have a live community discussion and fireside chat, and we'll discuss some action items and additional ways that you all will be able to contribute to this after action review process and development of an improvement plan. So just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, we have full Zoom and audio uh, via the web link that you should have received and are hopefully using right now. Um, for those that are on audio only, you'll only be able to hear us. You won't be able to obviously see and all participants will receive the link to the recording as well as all the materials shared in today's session. Those will be posted publicly to our website following today's hot wash, and we will be emailing everyone who registered the link to that information. But most importantly, I'd like to talk a little bit about active engagement today. I think many of us are very used to traditional webinars where it's a lot of uh, the presenters and panelists talking at you, uh, but we're trying to do these open community forums a little bit differently and really get your engagement throughout the process. So we have a couple of different ways that we are requesting that you all participate today. Um, obviously due to the large number of participants, participants are muted throughout the duration of today's session. However, we will be uh, actively using the question and answer feature in Zoom. So when you have questions for the panelists or for you know, the audience, we'd encourage you to put those questions into that Q&A feature in Zoom. We also know that many of you may have some commentary that you want to share about your own experiences and best practices, and you're welcome to share that using the chat feature in Zoom. So there are two different features with different purposes, um, but it's a great way to interact and we will actively be looking at those. All the panelists will be as well throughout the duration. And lastly, we are using a tool called Mentimeter today. So there's going to be a number of opportunities throughout today's session that you're going to be able to answer some really key poignant questions uh, and help to contribute to data and inputs from the community on. And with that, I'd just uh, like to give uh, a quick introduction. So my name is Rebecca Harnett. I'm a senior director with NAPSIG Foundation. Been here for um, about six or seven years now. And joined with me is uh, Molly Shar with NISJIP. Molly, did you want to take a couple minutes to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. And um, just to clarify on that slide there, I'm uh, Molly Shar, actually serving as the Executive Director of the National States Geographic Information Council, NISJIC. Um, I know that many of you are familiar with NISJIC. Some of you may be not quite as familiar. Um, I'd offer this introduction. Um, NISJIC is a 30-year-old organization that supports state level cooperation in the effort to advance national coordination of geospatial information with a really strong emphasis on partnerships. And our original and core membership is made up of state geographic information officers and state GIS coordinators. Um, this critical position in state government, I'm sure um, many of you know, um, serves as an advocate to local governments and state agencies to integrate um, geospatial technology into their business practices, encourages spatial data to be shared through 
Open Data Portal um, works to save money for local governments and state agencies on procuring geospatial technologies through shared negotiated contracts and uh, much more. Um, in the context of large scale disasters, the value of the state GIO or coordinator just can't be overstated, especially with the varying scales of those disasters and the level of response needed and the required amount of coordination and collaboration by local, state, uh, tribal, and federal governments. NISJIC's Geospatial Preparedness Committee especially meets regularly and conducts outreach in an ongoing effort to develop tools, identify resources, and build partnerships to support the effectiveness of GIS in disaster planning and response. And that's really why we're especially excited to join with our partners at the NAPSIG Foundation and URISA um, in organizing this National Pandemic GIS Task Force. And even more importantly, um, participating with all of you as stakeholders to learn from uh, your experiences so far in COVID-19 as we look to the future. Great, thank you so much, Molly, for sharing all that. And uh, we will get that slide corrected. It was a last minute ad in there, so thank you <laughs> before that goes out. And I did wanna mention, Eurissa was planning on joining us, their executive director, Wendy, um, but unfortunately, just due to the current hurricanes coming up the coast, she was not able to make it on today, uh, but they are certainly with us. And I actually know that their board of directors is joined with us in the participant side as well. So. Thank you, uh, both Nishik and Yarissa, for the partnership on this. It's been it's been a very good experience, I think, for everyone, and we're definitely stronger by working together on these issues. So, so I did want to just highlight kind of who's with us today, very briefly, um, so you get a sense of we we've got about 750 folks uh, confirmed for today from across the United States, across disciplines, and across um, the different levels of government. So this is a really good breakdown and gives you a sense of who's all joined on the participant side today. And fundamentally what we're working to do is establish a foundation for data-driven public health and emergency management system and really trying to unify efforts that historically may have been disparate or haven't had the opportunity to have to come together in the way that they had for COVID and how can we leverage that to increase our resilience and preparedness for future pandemics and other types of incidents as well. So this is just a sense of some of those different equities that have had to come together during COVID and that we're working together towards this common vision and our efforts to unify. So you all are, all are a part of the broader COVID-19 technology and GIS after action review process. And currently we're right here in the middle in August and conducting the second virtual engagement session. Uh, so we will be working together with our partners to develop an AAR and improvement plan coming out of this, acknowledging that it's version one since we are still very much in the response and recovery phases of COVID. But this is an important effort. Uh, we are coordinating uh, heavily with FEMA, HHS, uh, other organizations within Department of Interior and others to ensure kind of a whole of nation and whole of community AAR process around this. And with that, I'd like to hand this over to Dr. David Alexander, uh, the Senior Science Advisor with Department of Homeland Security's Science and Technology Directorate to share with us some opening remarks. David, over to you. Great, Rebecca. Thank you very much. And uh, Molly, thank you as well. Uh, DHS s and has had a long history of collaboration with NAMSIG and NISTIC, so I'm definitely honored to participate in today's webinar and provide some opening remarks. It's always a pleasure to engage uh, the larger community uh, and, and renew some relationships that, you know, we have built along the way. Uh, as the country has witnessed over the last couple months, you know, crises like the COVID pandemic have created some significant disruptions to daily life and pose some new operational challenges towards securing our homeland, protecting our citizens, and safeguarding our communities. Uh, what we have seen is that there's a lot more to a crisis like a pandemic uh, than just addressing the, the core elements of the pandemic. You know, a lot of cases we have compound and cascading effects uh, that we're realizing across society today. While compound events may pose even more challenges, 
we see synergy between how communities are addressing their COVID issues with strengthening their community's ability to address other natural disaster challenges. In other words, I think there's some opportunity to achieve some common goals. I think a venue like this is a way to identify those opportunities uh, and catalyze those lessons learned as well as share knowledge across the community. It's also important to note that as devastating as COVID-19 has been for us and the nation, it represents a, a great nationwide innovation challenge and in pushing across those uh, often siloed or disconnected sectors that Rebecca mentioned, uh, particularly public safety, public health, scientists and technologists, and rallying those groups to work together in rapidly solving some of the most vexing challenges and implementing solutions that we never thought possible or solutions that we hadn't uh, intended and want to apply differently. In other words, communities need resilience and innovation to drive down risk and strengthen our nation's ability to withstand these uncertain events and bounce forward much stronger than before. Resilience is an important mission agenda for DHS as well as DHS s &T. And I can't stress that enough uh, that COVID in many ways has just amplified that mission and the important role that Homeland Security as an enterprise, not just DHS, but the key state, local, private sector, infrastructure, public health and communities represent in that ecosystem. While we realize that routine crises are not always the best times to experiment, I think catastrophic events often serve as a catalyst to innovation and can provide produce profound change. They can be profound drivers of change, in many cases leading to technology breakthroughs from R&D or technology adoption. And I think we've seen that in both cases under this pandemic. And that more slow moving chronic disasters compared to more acute fast moving disasters require more frequent hot washes and recurrent self-reflection on what is working and what's not. I think that's what's especially important about this webinar today. It echoes that key point that in disasters that are long and drawn out, we can't always wait until the disaster is over to regroup and figure out what worked and didn't. So, so the pandemic has also emphasized a need for us to increase our resilience across between partners at all levels and across all aspects. Uh, what we've witnessed is some breakdowns in both domestic and global humanitarian relief systems, disruptions in supply chains, as well as impacts that we never imagined. Because uh, even though we've had severe and catastrophic events, we've never in the history of this country has had every state and territory under a national disaster or a national emergency. And that makes that especially unique in this case. It's also important to emphasize again that COVID has offered us the opportunity to form strong relationships and reinforce relationships that pre-existed or to grow those relationships that we've thought of but never acted on. Uh, I think it's especially important to recognize the key roles that first responders, public health, uh, emergency managers, as well as technology and data scientists play in addressing these types of challenges. We need to continue to build and strengthen those relationships, and we need to continue to work on updating our pandemic plans to ensure that the latest and in innovative data science, analytics, and technology are being leveraged and are being translated into standard business practices. So as we look beyond COVID-19, it is critical to take a hard look at what we've learned and the capabilities we built and matured and to ensure that we've incorporated those into our pandemic response plans as well as our other disaster response plans so that we can improve our overall resilience across all types of incidents. And yeah, you know, I'd be remiss in not recognizing the important contribution that geospatial technologies have played, uh, particularly when they have been combined with other solutions these technologies have been particularly effective toward improving our preparedness planning, our first response, and our disaster recovery operations. In other words, I think it's important to recognize that you know, we are in an age where we've moved beyond it's just about the map to it's about what we're able to do with that map through analytics, 
convey visual context to enhance situational awareness, advance science-informed decision-making to produce data-driven decisions that can be adjusted and refined on the fly to meet the pace of operations. In other words, do we need to make, to be at, at the mercy of perfect, uh, but we can adapt because we've got an answer that's good enough for now. Uh, so we've got a great set of panelists, as Rebecca mentioned, that represent different sectors of the whole community, each of whom I know is excited to share their stories and lessons learned. And I'm looking forward to learning from today's panelists as well. So again, thank you all for participating and thank you, Rebecca and Molly, for inviting me to provide some opening remarks. Rebecca, you're on mute. Okay, great. Uh, sorry about that. Thank you, David, very much uh, for your opening remarks and really setting the stage for today's hot wash. Certainly some key points for consideration cut throughout today's session for all the participants. Um, feel free to pose questions. And with that, we're actually gonna move into our first, uh, first set of questions for our participants today. Um, so you can see there's a link up in the chat feature where you can easily grab that to be able to live answer some questions in Mentimeter. And our key questions at this stage are prior to COVID, did your agency have a pandemic response plan in place? Um, and there's a second question following that around, did your agency successfully use its pandemic response plan to guide COVID-19 response? So if you could all just take a quick moment, uh, you can scan the QR code up on the screen or grab the link provided here and provide your input on these two questions. All responses are anonymous here, and this will be really insightful information for all of you, as well as for our panelists today as they dive into some of the stories that they're going to share. So I am just gonna pull up the responses so you can hopefully see those coming in live. Great, so we're seeing it's, a, it's an interesting split here. We've got a, about 41% uh, did have a pandemic plan in replace, 24% did not, and a portion of our stakeholders are not aware. So that's very interesting insights on that. And we'll just um, take a look at the second question here as well. Great, so did your agency successfully use your pandemic response plan to guide COVID-19 response? So 43% are reporting yes, and actually 57% are reporting no. Uh, so that's an interesting kind of a breakdown there. Um, and I think it's a good precursor to uh, our, our next uh, speaker and our keynote today on intelligence-led pandemic plans for the city of Chicago. So joined with us is Christopher Shields, Assistant Commissioner of Chicago Department of Public Health. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Christopher. Great, thank you. Am I coming through? Loud and clear, yes. Loud and clear, fantastic. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I think one of the key components that I want to address before we go into the slide deck is while all of you are represented from across the United States, you may or may not understand the city of Chicago as a whole. So our population base is 2.75 million people. Uh, under our authority, there are 35 hospitals which represent 9,000 acute care beds which is 40% of the total beds for the state of Illinois as a whole. So when I go into the, the PowerPoint here and we talk about the intelligence that dr drives the planning cycle and the intelligence that's ultimately gonna drive the response, keep that in the back of your head of 2.75 million people are under our responsibility and 9,000 acute care beds. So next slide. So within the city of Chicago, yes, we did have a pandemic influenza plan. Uh, we have a number of plans, policies, and procedures in place. Um, we play the theory, and you may have heard it, horseshoes and hand grenades. The idea is I have a structure for a response, a protocol, or a procedure for an activity that may or may not 
exactly match whatever threat we're working with, but I have enough to score a point, to get us in the game, to move the ball downfield. So we use a lot of different data components to inform these construction processes for all of our documents. And while I'm going to be speaking about the health and medical or the ESF-8 side of the house, there are lots of data that inform decision trees into how a plan is built, how a document is built. So we look at um, what we have here is a forward-facing website. It's called the Chicago Healthcare Atlas. This is what brings the health department forward into the planning circle. It covers our population density. It goes through the economic hardships, the social determinants of the population. And the reason that is so critical is depending on the threat that we're facing, it is going to impact a different segment of society, a different segment of our jurisdiction. And while our friends on the East Coast and our friends on the West Coast have those natural disasters that happen all the time, you use this data, whether you know it or not, to inform decision trees and inform responses. So all these data points serve as a predictive analytic planning process for us to look at emergencies, and we're going to talk about pan flu today. Next slide. So what we do, and I have a very lovely epidemiological division, and they love bars and charts. Bars and charts are fantastic for representing data, telling us we're going up, we're trending upwards, we're trending downwards. I like heat maps. Heat maps identify quadrants and zones within a city. This is our impact area. This is an, a contingent area or a contiguous area that may be impacted moving forward. So what we look at is take our threat run it against our threat hazard analysis and say, okay, if we do this, then what happens? If we look at this, what happens? So I have an example up here. It's seasonal influenza. Uh, it can be the same thing for special events. It can be the same thing for flooding. It could be whatnot. What happened last year? What is the historical average? Who were my impact areas or the most impacted population or zone in our, our jurisdiction? How did hospitalizations change as a result of what was going on last year and what can I do to look at comorbidities or underlying medical conditions that are going to influence or impact the population during a response. Next slide. So the city of Chicago, um, while we do have a freestanding pandemic influenza plan, I still, I'm still a firm believer in horseshoes and hand grenades. We have an emergency response plan that's multifaceted, 19 elements within our response plan, critical infrastructure, EMS, first responder groups, continuity of government teams, planning, finance, the whole whatnot. Those groups meet together every two years to go through the city's emergency operations plan. And then what is born out of that are sub annexes or sub special groups that focus in on targeted threats. So we were blessed last year, 2019, to exercise the city of Chicago's pan flu plan against the all of nation's crimson contagion exercise. We took that as an opportunity to go through everything that we believe to be true and try to train a new executive leadership, a new mayor, a new seated commissioner. We were two years into a new presidency and governorship. What is it going to take for the city of Chicago to go into a response? And one of the pieces that we did differently with this particular annex that we have not done in some of our other documents is we did a high and low variance. We predicted the worst that could happen and the not worst. So we used Spanish flu and H1N1 as our two parallel sides of the puzzle to say, this is what could potentially happen within our jurisdiction. And the other pieces, instead of writing the plan to say, this is my operations section, this is my logistics section, this is my planning assumption, this is what's going to happen with communications, we wrote it as a, as a structured COA. So courses of action or decision trees for executive leaders based on the pandemic curve, at this point in time, I should have considerations associated to one, two, three. If I haven't done these, I need to think about it, or is there something happening that I'm going to skip that completely and I'm going to move forward in time. So way, the way we structured this was to take the worst event, Spanish flu, H1N1, which was a high infectivity, low mortality event, and then structure that on an 18-month pandemic cycle to get us a set of decision trees for our executive leaders. Next slide. So this is an example of a crosswalk, and it basically is identifying at month eight of our simulated pandemic uh, event. These are the international or national considerations or concerns that are going on. 
and then we fl flavor in, these are the Chicago specific considerations. And these are highbrow. This isn't a specific decision tree, but this is like the highbrow piece of it. So in our pandemic influenza at month eight, we are expecting the state of Illinois to have 25,000 incident uh, illness, illnesses and 12,500 outpatient visits. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see the state of Illinois, uh, and we're at month five in this response, is 162,000 uh, illnesses, and our death count is at 7,300 and climbing. The slide deck is about a week old, so we're above that. Go ahead, next slide. So this is how our pandemic timeline lays out, and it goes from the pre-event planning stage into the preparedness stage into that pre-response initial response factor what i want to highlight here is between months four and five is when we had predicted our agency would be starting into that initial response We've already gathered intel, we've already started solidifying positions, but now we're going to step off with the first confirmed case. As part of the SARS COVID response, that occurred in 26 days. From the moment of acknowledging that there was a threat to the moment that I had my first patient contact, 26 days. So right now, if you're thinking about planning theory, um, our assumptions were a little bit off here. Next slide. But within our panfluanics, these were all the planning considerations or planning assumptions that we believed would be true during the course of an 18 month campaign. And as we, you can see on the slide, all of these have been impacted already and we're at 214 days, 215 days into the response. So every single one of these has happened except for the vaccination campaign. So during normal seasonal influenza, you're predicting that you're going to have seasonal vaccine anywhere between six and nine months out from sub, uh, subtyping of the, the virus itself. So we are trending in that particular line, but right now we are still planning for a vaccine campaign. Next slide. So for you guys, for how did this get operationalized? Lots of data is coming in to be consumed by data scientists, by our epi divisions, by our, our health directors to look at what is, going to, what is going on and how is that going to inform change. Now this is not all the data that's coming into the city of Chicago. This is the data that's coming in specifically for the health impacts. So there are companies out there to do predictive analytics globally to say this disease has now popped in X country, I predict based on uh, transmission uh, availability, uh, global movement. This is how long this disease could potentially take until it gets to the city of Chicago. Then, of course, I think everyone's fallen in love with the John Hopkins heat maps and showing just the rapid progression of this particular disease. We use our health atlas to inform decisions as our population moves across the city. Uh, we have sections that 10 years ago were not power dependent and now they are power dependent. So how does that inform the planning cycle? And then we layer all this under the ESRI subsystems or the GIS subsystems onto a, uh, um, a heating map and are able to turn things off or turn indicators on and off to drive our decisions. And then locally we have Argonne National Labs, which helps us do plume modeling and predictions on some other threats that the city faces. But we were able to use them to uh, also give us that um, cluster detection and pluming of where the disease was moving in our population. Next slide. So how do you operationalize the plan? And I, I modified this a little bit um, from an earlier iteration. In the upper left-hand corner, uh, the city of Chicago was notified in the very first week of January that we were going to be one of the first five uh, receiver airports for potential patients coming from the Hubei province of China. Very similar to the Ebola response in 2014 and 15, uh, we were going to be receiving all Chinese nationals in and had to have uh, isolation and quarantine protocols in place and screening protocols in the airport. And at that time, we weren't looking at a lot of patients that were exiting China because China had already gone into lockdown. And then, of course, you really can't operationalize a plan until your local media source gives you a moniker and a branding logo. So bottom left, uh, thank you, ABC, uh, telling us that we had corona in Chicago. The remainder of the pictures are more or less how things got going, from first case identification, multiple media conferences, to establishing a city uh, command cell and a state command cell, and then operationalizing components that we had only theorized as in needing. So in the lower right, right-hand corner is the McCormick Alternate Care Facility. That facility was stun up, uh, stood up in 26 days and was capable of receiving 3,000 complex uh, Medicaid, um, 
medically managed patients, um, all COVID positive. Next slide. So this is our organizational structure for a response, and it really does not change uh, de depending on the threat or depending on the event. So the city of Chicago hosts just over 2,000 special events a year. Um, 15 of them are a million people a day. This same structure works as it does for flooding, as it does for localized uh, fires, and it, as it's working for us now for a medical response. So we initiated the 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 SARS response is a health response, completely containment. Identify the source, contain it, find its vectors, and shut it down. And then once it got out of the box that we could no longer be in containment mode, we moved to a unified command structure in the city, which brought all of the city structure in place, including our private sector. So the city of Chicago has about 800 agencies as part of our healthcare enterprise, and they're part of our public sector or public private task force component. We brought all those people into the emergency operations center or a liaison for them to go through this is the planning methodology this is what we're looking at courses of action over the next seven to ten days what are the ripple impacts on your agency your subsector what's going on in the city of Chicago if we do this what's going to happen next so next slide So what we used our GIS overlay for initially was to identify by census track patients that had tested positive or were considered patients under investigation. Now, this is a political hot button and it's been um, utilized in some jurisdictions and gone to court legislatively in other jurisdictions. We used it as a mechanism to not identify the individual, so not to release any of their PHI information, but to ensure that first responders going into that zone of the city were aware that there was an active threat going on. And I'm going to use an example. Just because I've tested positive to SARS-CoV does not mean that my neighbor two floors above me does not set their house on fire. And there's going to be a fire response. And that means there's going to be an evacuation of the building. And that means I'm going to be leaving that building. I was in a contained space and now I'm in an open space. So we wanted to be able to provide a level of care for our first responders coming in. Then we used it for cluster detection. Were we seeing case development outside of what we were expecting? So outside of a residential setting versus a, a uh, joint housing piece, outside of a particular zone in the city. All of that information started driving decisions on where do I need to test? So if this population is impacted, do I need to test contingent uh, zones of the city? Do I need to look at specific ethnicity groups to do testing? And the idea with testing was not to validate that we had disease here, it was to validate the prevalence of the disease that we had there. And then at the end, all of that is going to drive our vaccination prioritization groups. Next slide. So these next set of slides are just how the GIS structure was utilized. I like this set because through the month of March, we went from 603 uh, people with positive infections in the U.S. to 161,000. So a geometrically growing problem. Next slide. Here is one of our forward-facing documents. We also, in the city of Chicago, have our COVID uh, 2019 web portal up, and this provides all the analytic data feeds for anyone that's going to be a consumer of the Chicago data to do their own papers. Uh, we have very large um, health and academic institutions in the city that pull our data down and do their own predictive analytics, do their own, this is what's happening, or this is what we're visualizing, or then micro it and say, this is what happens, or this is what's happening with within my institution itself or within my academic setting. So this is the case positivity rate. It's going to show it on a progressive scale. In the state of Illinois, we do a rolling two-week average to give us what's going on in the city and where are we trending. Are we trending upward or are we trending downward? Next slide. And then this is, again, as I said earlier, my epis love bar graphs. And while this bar graph is fantastic, it shows you that we were doing really, really bad at April, March. And then we started turning downward and we're kind of hovering in that this is not great, but it's not too bad. Um, this is great, but it doesn't drive operational decisions for me in a specific space. If I had to look at all 440 square miles and just throw something at it, this map is, or this chart doesn't tell me where to throw it. Next slide. So here we go with our uh, heat mapping, and this is again percent positivity. And the reason this is important is it started showing specific zones within my jurisdiction that either had an increasing case count, 
either had new transmission of disease or they had taken the, the precautions that we instituted and they are rolling backwards. They were not having new infectivity. They were not having new transmission. Next slide. And then this one again is the same slide on the two week rolling average. And what you can see is from the left to the right, our red zones are getting bigger, but so are our blue zones. So the question is, is the information being consumed at the same level at the base civilian level? Are they getting the information and understanding it? Are they, in for, in, are they utilizing the resources made available to enact change or are we going to have to enact change here? And I think what's really important to highlight on this particular slide is this map, if I were to turn off disease and put on economic uh, disparity, that's exactly what it would look like. So we are now targeting zones of the city based on uh, your economies and your social determinants, not necessarily just because it's in the northwest quadrant of the city. Next slide. So I'm going to conclude today by kind of going through Yes, we had a pan flu plan, but what were the successes? And I think every plan, policy, procedure, it can be written or drafted in a bubble, but if you don't have uniform buy-in across all the sectors that are going to initiate or utilize that document, it would be a failure. So the benefit for us is our entire planning team across the city had been engaged long before we exercised this in 2019 and long before we pulled it and said, we got to do it for this re response. We also layered in the transition of command. And everyone says, I'm going to open up command and I'm in charge, I'm the, I'm the incident commander. Well, that was great during containment. It was definitely a health mission. That's all it was focused in on. But as soon as it became a systemic problem, we opened up unified command and transferred to emergency management some of those responsibilities that the health department is not uniquely set up for. I don't do logistics. I don't do force protection. I don't do a lot of things that make a city function. So to bring them in early and get that up and running was essential for us. And then that incorporation of our COAs, we were able to layer those COAs out into time and explain it to not only the political side, but the responder side, and then not the responder side, but to the civilian side. Yes, there is a plan. Yes, we have thought it through. Yes, we are enacting it. Yes, we are working through the plan. You are okay, and we are moving forward. The lesson learned in the big one, quite frankly, is our planning assumptions did not address full systemic failure. So while we had said all of these things are going to cascade or are cascading events over a course of 18 months, we had all of them collapse within the first 120, 140 days. And that really kind of put us at a disadvantage. Um, if we hadn't planned for it, uh, we, would have, we would have been out of the game. Uh, because we had considered it, it just put us on um, our A game. Also, the non-traditional consumers of response resources put us at a disadvantage for a while there. Um, the idea here is while you are using protective equipment, your personal protective equipment, you have your traditional healthcare enterprise, you have your EMS side of the house, they're the consumers of general PPE. But then when you start going into testing and you start going into shelter populations, and you start going into containment and protect mode, you're, you're diversifying the use of a scarce resource to in theory stop the progression of a disease. So that's something that we're going to need to address in the future. And then the rapid progression, quite frankly, strained our infrastructure phenomenally. I said earlier, 9,000 acute care beds, we sit at a static 750, 760 ICU beds. We were able to scale that up to just over 1,400 ICU beds to consume our most ill patients, but that wasn't enough. We needed to bring on the alternate care facilities. We needed to bring on isolation and quarantine sheltering. All of that came into play as part of the response. Next slide, and I think I am finished here. All right, thank you very much, and I look forward to the other speakers. Christopher, thank you so much um, for that overview. I think that really got in depth on a, on a model, in essence, for the nation in terms of a pandemic response plan and the annex that you developed. Um, we are going to just take a couple of questions. So for our participants, if you can, there's a question here for you about your um, your agency's pandemic response plan, and did it include production and use of data-driven decision support technology similar to what you saw Christopher share, or maybe a variation of that in your pandemic response plan? So if you can um, complete the Mentimeter, again, the link for that is in the chat, and then you can also scan the QR code. And while we hear from you, I just have a couple of questions for, for for Christopher, um, before we get into the technical question, 
a question for you on in your lessons learned you ca you captured some things about you know your planning assumptions didn't include kind of all failures and i'm curious how is um, the city of Chicago looking at potential updates to that plan given what you've already learned in both the successes and challenges that you faced in COVID? So yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so the city of Chicago doesn't produce agriculture as an example. So we were, we were taken back when there was all of a sudden the run on toilet paper and shampoo and all the things that are consumables to the average citizen, but were not necessarily in scarce quantities at the time. So now we're looking at what are the things that our population demanded of local government and is that something we need to get in the business of? Do we need emergency contracts in place just in case a person can't go out to the store and procure something? Can I get it from someplace else? The same applies for the pharmaceutical consumption, the personal protective equipment assumption, all these things. While government has a role in response, we can't become the sole source of everything for duration of a response. So the bringing on of volunteer and donations management, that was a piece that while it's always sat in the corner is something we may, may potentially use, we brought it to bear for this because there's a lot of industry in the city of Chicago that had a lot of this stuff on the shelves and they could no longer move it. When transportation shut down, now I'm sitting on fixed inventory in warehouses. I can't move it. How can the city either procure it or use it as part of the donations management cycle? You're still on mute. Thank you. Uh, there's one more question I'd like to cover with you before we move on. And I know there's gonna be a couple of other questions in the Q&A, but how did, the, how did Chicago make sure that addresses were you for COVID positive individuals was accurately captured? Did Chicago Department of Health uh, use a GIS uh, coding application or what was the mechanism by which that was handled? Yeah, absolutely. So as positive tests are rolled up through your lab infrastructure, we were getting daily reports on X individual and all this, the, the information associated with individual, including residential address and whatnot, has tested positive for this particular disease. And while I don't necessarily understand how the poly, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, the shape files work. We were able to load um, a, a sequence database into our GIS mapping, and it was able to plot it out on our fire and EMS uh, CADA systems. So as they're rolling into a jurisdiction, you couldn't just go into it and say, I want to find all um, positive cases. But if that census track um, was part of your response, it would pop up and say uh, respiratory illness in this zone. So it was not specific to, well, I had all the way down to your apartment. Uh, for our response partners, it was a census track or a, a block within that zone. Very interesting. Thank you, Christopher. I think there's a couple of other questions to that same end in the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, you're welcome to answer those if you have some time today, right, within uh, typing them into the Zoom. Um, I did Absolutely. want to make a quick mention here about the feedback we've gotten from all of the participants around this question of, did your pandemic plan include use of data-driven decision support technology? And we're seeing that there's about 37% are saying yes, about 34 saying no, and about 29% don't know. So it's a pretty even split here amongst kind of those that are including it. So it's definitely something to look to to the future as we look to how we can improve and update our plans and better leverage the same data science technology that we use during the response as well as in the planning process. Um, so with that, Christopher, thank you so much for the keynote today. This was a phenomenal example. Uh, and I think it carries through very nicely to our next series of community stories. Uh, so just some, some considerations for all of our participants to consider as you listen to this series of stories and engage our panelists today, um, you know, really looking at what are the key operational decisions uh, that emerged during COVID and what data science, data analytics, and GIS solutions were developed, how were they actually used by decision makers, and then I think kind of the million dollar question in all of this is could the solution be set up and or pre-staged in preparedness, I'll, you know, be that in the planning process, exercised against trained with all of the above, so it's already in place prior to the next event. 
So with that, I'm gonna hand this over to our first community story coming out of the state of Oregon. Um, Daniel uh, Stolb is the GIS program coordinator with Oregon Office of Emergency Management. And he'll cover for us today using GIS and analytics to inform statewide response uh, in COVID-19. Um, and I, he was originally planned to be joined today by uh, Elena Mayfield, but unfortunately, due to the wildfires in Oregon, uh, Elena has been activated to support that. So with that, I'd like to hand this over to Daniel. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Um, so today I'd like to talk with you guys a little bit about kind of what we've been doing here in Oregon related to the COVID-19 response. So the first image that you guys are seeing on the screen here is showing one of the press briefings that our governor had as she was talking about the reopening of the state. Uh, also in combination with that, some images detailing the uh, statistics related to a set of personal protective equipment as well as the reopening status across the state, and then the view of all of the Western states, their situation dealing with COVID uh, cases and deaths than our daily schedule. So some of the, you know, when we talk about response, we really start talking about what are the data sources, what sort of information can we pull to be able to really kind of paint the story for what's happening out there. We had a wide variety of different data sets that we were pulling into our applications to really show what was happening out there. And it came in a wide variety of different formats and sources to include uh, our op center application. I'm sure many of you out there utilize systems like WebEOC. This is a lot like WebEOC, except it does not have a GIS component. It is just a SQL server, but it is capturing that incident data. The other uh, components out there, we were pulling data and information from public health dashboards. Uh, specifically, there were a lot of uh, dashboards that were uh, created using the Tableau Public software solution. And various websites, you know, we had a whole wide variety of different websites that were created. Everyone had their own unique flavor for, you know, what was, what was happening out there. And last but not least, the, the curse of the spreadsheet. Now, there were a lot of spreadsheets created for this event, uh, and uh, so we had to deal with that information. Uh, for our solutions out there, we really took a look at, you know, this was going to be a long-term event. We wanted to be able to have something that was high performance uh, and utilize systems that were off of our internal systems so that in case things that were shared to the public ended up going viral, that pun was intended, uh, to be able to show and demonstrate uh, information to the public and keep them informed without impacting operations. So a lot of our solutions utilize the ArcGIS Online uh, server set there. To start with, uh, certain initiatives created uh, the opportunity for us to obtain feedback from the community and from our partners to really show kind of what the results were. And so we utilize Survey123 to collect and gather a whole slew of data to include uh, regular reports from our county and tribes across the state to show uh, what the status of PPE, personal protective equipment was for their jurisdiction. Also uh, emergency hygiene resources, you know, what resources were available for clean hand washing. We also had a pretty major initiative uh, very early on to identify first responder childcare needs so uh, being able to send out a survey to all of our response partners, whether it was fire chiefs, fire boards, uh, emergency management agencies, et cetera, state uh, agencies, and really uh, ask and survey to see, you know, what uh, sort of childcare did they need to have? What ages of their kids, what schools did they attend? And be able to see if there was truly a, a need out there to be able to provide for childcare because a lot of these responders can't take time off to be able to take care of kids at home. So a lot of initiatives out there that uh, we utilize the Survey123 solution on. The other um, tidbit that I'll add here too is we had weekly, uh, and we still continue to have weekly reports of the PPE uh, from our tribal and county jurisdictions. And we use the feature report functionality to be able to have a consolidated or report that talked about what the status was of PPE for those jurisdictions. 
Of course, this is the year of the dashboard. We built a lot of dashboards to show what things were going on there. We had our own COVID dashboard, uh, but also dashboards related to a lot of initiatives that we had, whether it was the PPE reporting, child care needs, and then the status of requests and mission assignments to state partners. We also built some hub sites, uh, first one being a public facing open data site so that the public could go and view and pull data down related to the total case count, case history, and PPE information. We also had a, an internal facing uh, PPE data website that showed and be able to uh, enable our partners to download consolidated PPE reports for all the jurisdictions that reported out PPE. And then last but not least, our secure data hub, which was a consolidation of all of our initiatives, uh, one single spot that our partners could then access and pull that data. Really kind of the, the big piece that I wanna talk about here relates to our story map. So we built a story map that really consolidated everything and put things together in one location to really have that overview of what was happening out there. Um, this indicates the current status of instance, request for assistance and PPE. The, the first component to that uh, really was in hazards overview. As this event was occurring and we knew that it was going to be a long duration event, we wanted to be able to have eyes on what was happening throughout the rest of the state. As you heard from Rebecca earlier, the person, uh, Elena, that was gonna be co-presenting with me, ended up going out on a fire, so wildfires are a big component. We also have a lot of drought occurring throughout the state. Now, there were a lot of essential elements of information that we wanted to be able to report out on and ensure that we had a good firm grasp on what was happening. Um, also, kind of as we transition and taking a look at the activity, you know, what sort of requests are being entered into the system, into our op center application? Is there a hold up on fulfilling requests? What type of requests and what's our activity looking like? Are we doing more or less now? Um, how are we compared to our peak on being able to, you know, pull down and fulfill those requests for assistance? But also transitioning to taking a look at who is requesting assistance, what jurisdictions are asking the most. Now, how are things looking overall for the incident compared to the last month, last week? And then also comparing the requests in disease activity. Really is the increase in cases over time also resulting in a net increase for requests for assistance from those jurisdictions. Not necessarily was this always the case here, as you can see on the chart there, but it did enable us to be able to take a look at the information that was coming in from multiple resources to then prioritize those jurisdictions that may not have the ability to reach out to us or uh, we had not heard from them in quite a while. Now, the other component to this too was the ability for us to be able to have a consolidated report out on what was happening. Uh, we utilized this story map to be able to do our resource planning meetings to figure out, are we then able to dedicate adequate resources? What sort of activity and prioritization are needed for the operational period? And really had us be able to discuss, you know, what, char what challenges are we having in fulfilling requests? If the processing time is taking significantly longer, you know, what are our roadblocks? What are our stumbling blocks to be able to address those needs? What are our outstanding missions? You know, what, what sort of things do we need to be able to uh, prioritize to be able to fulfill those requests for assistance? So kind of to, to close things out a little bit, some key lessons in the future, uh, share, share, share alike. Uh, really, the, this was a primarily a data sharing effort here. Um, throughout the response, you know, making access to data is critical. You know, regardless of the size of the response, uh, sharing information is, is really of key uh, for any type of event. Uh, we also kind of developed some uh, standard procedures and processes for us as we start building out and taking a look at the ArcGIS online platform being able to organize data and information into groups. 
We here in Oregon utilize the emergency support function or ESF model. So being able to organize data and analytics by group allowed us to be able to share content with appropriate individuals. We also threw thumbnails onto our official and finalized apps to let folks know that these were the final and official versions. And I can't stress this enough working with your partners. Um, I mentioned earlier about you know, data sharing being a real key piece, but working with your partners and you know, a lot of the information that we had and were reporting out on were not owned by our agency. They were owned by Oregon Health Authority or other partners. Um, but also involving your partners at the start of the event, uh, start of the initiative. That allows you to evaluate things like what's the intent and the purpose? Does this need to have a public sharing option? Or what sort of solutions should we employ for this? Follow on application development. What are the data maintenance requirements? How often does that data need to be updated? And then that will then allow us to determine appropriate staffing requirements. Then the last piece here is bringing everything together in a story map. Um, really the ability that we have to really just send out one link to our partners to keep them informed about what was happening out there really uh, allowed us to do that full telling the story and walking the map um, and show what was happening out there. Um, the, dealing also with story maps here, these are really easy to template out. Um, a lot of the dashboards that we built will be utilized in the future as we look at reporting out on you know, statistics related to requests for assistance and prioritizing resources. With that said, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk at the uh, webinar today. Thank you. Daniel, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. I think it's pretty uh, impressive how you really worked across all the different functional areas uh, needed to support COVID-19 response and really integrated those capabilities. Um, just a quick question for you, and, and before I, I pull that, I do want to mention for the, our participants, we have another question that's open-ended for all of you in the Mentimeter. So if you want to pull that back up, you can and enter in your feedback on that. But um, just in the essence of time, I want to continue forward with our conversation, Daniel. Um, how many of these capabilities did you have somewhat pre-staged or ready to go prior to COVID or, you know, as you started to see what was, you know, occurring internationally, did you look at what you could have, you know, ready to go to be able to support the response? A short answer, uh, next to none uh, were pre-built. Um, we did a whole lot of a scramble and put stuff together. Um, but the, the good news is a lot of the stuff that we did build for this event is wash, rinse, and repeat, and we can recycle and reuse these solutions for future events. Uh, we had built story maps in the past uh, for all of our natural disasters uh, and other disasters that we dealt with. In fact, uh, we had utilized the story maps now, but for February's uh, winter storms that we had roll through the state here. Um, but a lot of that information, yeah, it was pretty much done on the fly. Uh, but it did kind of help us highlight what sort of prioritize, uh, prioritized data sets we would have or need or want kind of moving forward there. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it was uh, scramble and we're going to put something together. It's really interesting, I think, what you shared. And I think we heard the same thing from Christopher with regards to the fact that a lot of the solutions that you implemented could be used across other hazards. And that's something we're, we've consistently heard from um, a number of other folks. So really interesting. Daniel, thank you so much for this uh, presentation and vignette. I think this has been very helpful. We are seeing some great feedback. I won't go through it all in the Mentimeter as well. And I'd encourage folks, we are capturing all of this for the AAR process to provide some feedback on what innovative approaches your agency took in applying GIS and data analytics to inform COVID-19 response. Um, but in the essence of time, I am gonna move forward and introduce our next uh, vignette coming out of FEMA Region 1 around leveraging technology to support dec decision-making on fatality management, medical supplies, PPE, and in monitoring social activity during pandemic response and recovery. And I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Melissa Surrett, uh, a senior planner uh, with FEMA Region 1, and she's joined by Jeff Segan and uh, Benjamin Trump, 
with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So with that, I'll hand this over to Melissa. Thank you so much. Uh, so for COVID response, I'm serving as the data analytics section chief. Um, and the Region 1 FEMA ASPR data analytics section was established early on in the COVID response. Uh, our section consists of staff from FEMA, HHS ASPR, which is the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, as well as the Army Corps, uh, Army Corps Engineering and Research Development Center. Our section was established to support key operational and decision-making needs around scarce resource requests by providing projections using state data. Our initial efforts focused on projections for ventilator shortfalls, fatality management, and PPE burn rates. We've since expanded our mission to include modeling and analysis for second wave threats, compounding events, and return to fiscal workspace efforts. The solutions we'll be presenting on has allowed the region to better posture ourselves, both internally and externally. The tools we have built have been provided to our state partners for their use to support current and future incidents. So with that, I'd like to turn it to Jeffrey Segan and Benjamin Trump to provide a brief overview of our efforts as well as the tools that have been developed. Thank you, Melissa. <clears throat> so as Melissa mentioned, um, Ben, Igor, and I uh, were mission assigned. We're part of the Army Corps of Engineers. We're missions assigned with uh, FEMA in late March. And initially, the uh, problems that we were trying to address were around ventilator shortages. Um, each state had its own uh, model as far as um, what they expected to be their increase in cases um, over the next uh, few weeks. And uh, the first thing we did was kind of uh, bring everything together under one roof to model um, cases and hospitalizations. And then we used that information to determine uh, when a state would run out of ventilators based on their current inventories. Um, <clears throat> this was used to allocate ventilators um, to Massachusetts and, and some other states. And later on, the, the next concern uh, was around PPE. Um, so our tool expanded to focus on, on PPE concerns, uh, as well as uh, hospital beds, uh, alternative care sites, and fatality management. Um, we saw that um, in New York State and internationally, and there were a lot of uh, issues around refrigeration capacity uh, or cremation capacity. And so we wanted to make sure we weren't going to see that in any of the New England states. Um, into the development of our model. Uh, we were originally using exponential uh, growth projections and about the time when our states were going through a, a peak in cases and our exponential models were no longer very valid in predicting the future. Um, our partners uh, at the Army Corps of Engineers down in, in Vicksburg uh, stood up the Erdic Sear model. Um, this allowed for, you know, it's depicted in the, the top right of the model. Um, it's a compartmental based model. It's, it's part of the CDC ensemble forecast. And it really allowed us to have a, a much better pre, uh, long term prediction of cases and hospitalizations. And so these model outputs now inform our decision support tools. Next slide, please. Um, the decision support tool for research allocation includes uh, various features. Um, that allow FEMA to understand which states are, are requesting resources and options to allocate uh, accordingly um, based on those states that are requesting. Um, this could be based on, on current need, um, based on uh, the population and the current caseload in states, or it could just be uh, equal distributions to requesting states. Next slide, please. Moving forward, uh, in January, we really wanted to focus on compounding threats and how can we build uh, uh, on, on what we learned uh, in the previous months and look at how uh, hurricanes will influence the spread of COVID and vice versa, how COVID will influence our concerns uh, around hurricanes, such as sheltering, um, what additional resources are needed for sheltering, um, how a sheltering needs to change uh, to accommodate the pandemic, um, and, uh, and also evacuations um, 
and and will will people's behavior to an evacuation order change uh, given that we're in a in a pandemic? Uh, will more or less people comply with that order? And and um, and what kind of displaced people can we expect to to see? Next slide. So our evacuation tool looks at a variety of different metrics. This is just uh, you know one snippet of it. Um, uh, here we're looking at uh, PPE that's needed both before and after a storm um, under various reuse scenarios. Um, our, our models allow the users to play around with uh, various parameters that can influence these, uh, these tables, uh, such as burn rates or the number of days before and after a storm that uh, displaced people would need uh, shelters. Next slide, please. And we are also looking at uh, using real-time uh, inundation forecasts from NOAA to uh, look at various critical facilities that may be inundated during a storm uh, and uh, you know, how, how this would affect the COVID response. So um, you know, we, we may be looking at additional facilities that we wouldn't otherwise be concerned with, um, such as dialysis centers or nursing homes, given that we're in a pandemic. Uh, it's much more con uh, consequential to relocate uh, certain vulnerable populations um, if, if they needed to, to move out of their facilities, um, such as uh, the elderly. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, this is a feature that, that we're also uh, building out um, and can help with real-time decision-making. Uh, so with that, I will pass it to Benjamin Trump for the next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so just in, in a couple slides, um, we're going to be going over an in-progress tool and deliverable that we're working on uh, within the data analytics team for Region 1. And it's driven by the fundamental question of how do our everyday choices increase or decrease the exposure potential um, that we as individuals or as teams in the workplace might become exposed to coronavirus. And so within this, um, when we're looking at, you know, the broader understanding of you know, risk from a pandemic perspective. Risk, um, you know, based on a mixture of you know, scholarly literature as well as uh, a variety of epidemiological response, is uh, three core variables. One is um, the hazard in and of itself. So this includes characterizing, you know, what COVID-19 is, as well as its relative concentration within the environment uh, based upon observed and likely activity. Uh, second is exposure, uh, which are uh, the variety of scenarios um, where individuals um, or populations uh, become exposed through that, con that concentrated hazard, um, where that hazard is allowed to spread within a population. Um, so th those instances of contact, if, if, um, if you can think of it that way. And last is the consequences, which is uh, the potential, uh, given a variety of underlying variables, um, that uh, after um, individuals or members of the population become uh, infected with COVID, that they will experience a range of possible health outcomes, uh, uh, you know, including uh, relatively mild symptoms to severe symptoms, uh, to symptoms requiring hospitalization or admission to the ICU or even death. And so within all of this, um, when we're thinking about our individual decision-making capabilities, um, of course, you know, there are factors that we can take, uh, such as cleaning our workspaces, um, or taking certain precautions uh, to reduce the concentration of the hazard to um, eliminate, you know, possible contacts on surfaces that co we may have with COVID. Um, and, you know, there are steps that we can take, um, you know, to potentially improve underlying baseline state of health. Um, a core metric that we're looking at, particularly as it, re as it relates to um, individual behavior on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as things like returning to work, um, we're trying to figure out how can we reduce opportunities for multiple exposures to COVID and therefore reduce the chance that we would suffer those uh, harmful consequences. So what we're going through is um, we've been working on this for a few weeks and we're going to be uh, delivering a prototype um, of one module later this week is something called micro exposure where we're linking up a variety of, um, of behavioral analysis and understanding of uh, core decision making within a given area. This includes things like um, the type of transportation choices that they have, the general masking activity, um, the broader social activities, such as with cell phone data tracking uh, where people are traveling to, where they spend their time, um, as well as uh, the 
um, overall environment within their workplace and things like that. So we're linking those together with a variety of probabilistic modeling tools um, and uh, uh, multi-criteria decision frameworks to output um, a relative understanding of how do the choices that I make um, influence an increase or decrease in my exposure to COVID and what is roughly that magnitude of exposure that I might be able to expect. Uh, next slide, please. So good, this is my um, last slide for today. Um, but what we're looking for, um, and we'll be producing um, a prototype of our transportation module. Uh, for now, this is a return to work model. Um, and so we're, what we're looking at is we're breaking down employee behavior um, of a set workplace into three components. Um, so one is your baseline risk. So if you were in a full lockdown uh, telework scenario, um, your exposure is not zero. Uh, you still uh, have certain activities like going outside, going to the grocery store, going to the gas station, and other activities uh, that do provide certain opportunities for exposure, and those need to be accounted for um, uh, as their baseline. Secondly is the, the choices of transportation that you would choose uh, to get from uh, your, your residence um, to your place of work, ranging from you know, your personal vehicle through things like carpooling and um, ride hailing um, up through and including different options of public transit. And, and in many cases, it's a combination of many of these things and we're accounting for that. Um, and lastly is uh, the workplace settings um, where we're trying to answer uh, some questions about like, how is the workplace set up? How, where are people traveling to? Where are they spending their time? Where are they likely to be congregating or touching common surfaces? And within each of these modules, we're asking some core questions about, um, you know, what is the likely concentration of COVID given the underlying um, situation uh, within the broader um, uh, metropolitan region, within the broader neighborhood area, um, as well as how do certain behavioral and social factors uh, possibly increase or decrease the chance that COVID may spread. And in that output, um, it's intended to not provide a specific point estimate um, at a very high level or at a very uh, granular level um, about how, li how likely your exposure scenarios of COVID will manifest, but instead give you an idea of are the choices that I'm making um, such that they're putting me at a gravely enhanced um, opportunity for COVID exposure, or is it relatively minor? And the hope is from a, from a return to workplace scenario, we can expand this out to a number of possible conversations, um, such as increase of you know larger social behaviors like sporting events or things like schools and a variety of other scenarios. And so, with that, I will uh, turn it back uh, to Melissa um, and to team. And thank you for listening. Thank you. So that concludes our formal uh, presentation. So I'll turn it back to you, Rebecca. Great, thank you so much, uh, Melissa, Jeff, and Ben uh, for that. That was a really interesting breakdown of the different analytical models uh, that you de both developed and implemented in, in COVID and some cascading incidents. Uh, we do have a question in the Q&A feature that I'd welcome you all to answer. And for our participants, feel free to pose questions um, to our panelists in the Q&A feature. I am gonna keep going in the essence of time um, because we are running a little bit behind schedule, uh, but that is okay. We've got some ways to make that up. Um, there is another question in the Mentimeter. You're welcome to answer that in there and then I'll pull those up as we finish up the next uh, vignette. But again, thank you very much, uh, Melissa, Jeff and Ben. Uh, very, very insightful and a lot that I think can be learned and taken forward to other communities. Um, as well as in preparedness for other incidents. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand this over to Ezekiel Peters, um, uh, and he will cover for us today automating and integrating medical healthcare capacity data reporting and analysis. Uh, and Ezekiel joins us from the Colorado Regional Health Information Organization. Uh, and we're very pleased to have you. So Ezekiel, over to you. And I just ask that we try to stay on time um, as much as possible. So thank so you. So I think what she means is I get to talk even faster than I usually do. <laughs> um, yeah. So this, this presentation is about automatically calculating uh, hospital bed availabilities and uh, done from health information exchange, admit, discharge, and transfer messages. So I have to define all that in this short period. Hopefully I'll do a decent job in covering the unknowns for this audience. So uh, quickly to get oriented, um, most of the action here happens in the Colorado North Central All Hazards region, which is a 10 county Denver Metropolitan Planning um, Homeland Security Emergency Management region, um, probably most closely associated with from a grants funding standpoint, I see I'm fading out here, um, 
as the state homeland security grant funds. Um, uh, as the FEMA folks already defined, um, another key part of the story is the U.S. Health and Human Services Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Responses Office, which is the ASPR. Um, the funds that come out of that program are the Hospital Preparedness Program, some of you may be familiar with, um, and those are run through the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment uh, Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response. One of the key implementing bodies for that is uh, in the same region is the Colorado North Central Region Healthcare Coalition, same geographic planning footprint, but not actually the same entity. Um, I work for uh, the Colorado Regional Health Information Organization, CARIO, which is a health information exchange in HIE. Hopefully I'll explain what that is. Um, and I'm the Emergency Medical Services Director, uh, which makes it unusual in that most HIEs do not have someone who's focused on emergency services and disaster uses of the health information exchange data. Uh, also in that role, I'm uh, one of the co-chairs for the EMS committee that serves all the North Central Region organizations kind of above on the slide. And then uh, turning attention to talking about bed availability and bed availability standards, um, as I'm being eaten by my background again, um, the, the, most of the HIE data are in what is called HL7 um, uh, languages and that the main um, message type that's sent there is in the format of admit, discharge, and transfer. Um, the, uh, that is not a commonly understood format in emergency management and uh, public health emergency preparedness. And so um, what uh, most people would know would be the OASIS standard uh, hospital availability exchange or have. And that is actually a codification of the have bed uh, standard that was used in the system that was deprecated a couple of years ago uh, in which bed availabilities from hospitals were reported to the ASPR. So um, a lot of states have a system like Juvare EM Resource, which we have, which is manual hospital reporting. Um, and originally that system was probably chosen because it would send data on hospital bed availability automatically into the ASPERS have bed system. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is just to give you an idea of uh, where HIEs are and that there's probably one you can partner with. Um, I'm certainly available as a resource to have those conversations. Uh, they are the uh, mostly post uh, high tech act structures that move data between various electronic health record systems in hospitals and doctor's offices and so on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Carrillo is a big one, relatively speaking. Um, it's, it covers 90% of the state by population. Um, next slide, please. And key to this story uh, is that we have 7.7 .7 million individual longitudinal, longitudinal patient records on file. So in that NCR planning region we're talking about, it's a population of about 3.2 million. So essentially everyone is in the database is key to this story. Next slide, please. Um, this is a much more conventional use, uh, sort of pre-COVID-19 and pre our work for ad, uh, what are the admit discharge transfer messages describing the movements of patients uh, through the uh, health system in general. So this would be, uh, the example here is sort of like you go to a emergency department that's not affiliated with your primary care physician and uh, he gets a message so that uh, he can work on continuity of care even though those two systems are disconnected via the HIE. Um, next slide, please. So um, basically, you know, we entered, I think this work, the COVID-19 period, a little bit more prepared than a lot of other HIEs and maybe got a little bit further uh, until how, how things were operationalized um, because of work we have been doing just in the last couple of years. So again, my position is new and kind of unique uh, and that's just since February of 2018. And in 2019, we were really focused actually on how we would operationalize HIE data with these coordinating structures in the North Central region. So um, we did the coalition surge test, which some of you may have been through. It's a, a large hospital evacuation exercise that's run through the healthcare coalitions. And um, in my EMS committee role, uh, we stood up an emergency medical services multi-agency coordinating center um, and uh, tried to work through various exercise problems we've had. Out of that work, um, the Healthcare Coalition financed looking at a way to virtualize that EMS MAC and also to discuss whether or not these HIE ADT messages um, would, uh, 
would be useful in sort of providing both situational awareness and decision support uh, in terms of how to allocate patients, where they could go, so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, we, as of August of last year, we're already sitting on funding to do the next report there. Uh, however, about that time as well, um, the ASPR uh, made a funding announcement uh, called ASPR Next. And so in consultation with the CDPHE, Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response, our healthcare coalition partners, and, and some consultation with ASPR, uh, we determined that we would submit a proposal on 31st of December um, to create a fully automated sort of self-contained um, bed information network prototype proof of concept. Um, and so that proposal is still in, and I have been told it's still live, but apparently ASPR has been a little busy and isn't reading proposals. But as a result of the way that this work was um, uh, put together um, sort of the in the third week of January, uh, our folks from CDPH EOEPR literally crossed the street and said, hey, you know that proposal, is there any way to accelerate the bed availability work so we can lean into this COVID-19 event? And so um, through a series of steps, we ended up in March and April in a rapid development process um, and uh, produced uh, this bed availability dashboard that I'm gonna show you images of here. Um, I think that that was probably, my last estimate I heard was it was something like we expended 850 hours of labor in about six weeks to get to sort of the prototype. And so um, we were really crunching it through. And so right now the current state is that um, we are, have about 50 uh, North Central Region Healthcare Coalition users that look at a tabular format, which I will show you of this dashboard uh, showing the bed availabilities. And um, the All Hazards Home and Security NCR is consuming a feed which will be displayed in their situational awareness system. Next slide, please. So just to give you some idea um, about how, you know, what we knew going into this from a technical standpoint, right, as we uh, knew that the HIE, as it stands today, only uses emergency department ADTs kind of for things to go to end users. Um, it's unknown uh, what messages we kind of had in the discard pile, but on our platform and what the contents of those messages look like that we might be able to turn into actionable information about other bed types. Um, we knew that we were going to have no uh, resources available from hospital uh, IT and clinical staff, basically, to help us interpret message contents we couldn't make sense of on our, of our on our own because COVID-19 was moving so rapidly. And as I already said, the bed type definitions are not really particularly standardized. And also it's actually not really known. I know definitive healthcare layer notwithstanding uh, about, about what the baseline counts of beds are within any given facility. And so kind of what's the denominator is a problem. So knowing those things in the consultation with CDPHE, we sort of came up with the following definition of what would constitute a minimum viable product. It would calculate emergency department, uh, pediatric emergency department, intensive care unit, and pediatric intensive care unit beds only. That's all we're going to look at for six major Colorado health systems, which would conveniently cover sort of the most uh, tertiary facility beds that would be referred to in the Denver metro area. Uh, and the standard but for sort of our accuracy was going to be we're going to have timely and accurate enough counts of those bed types for CDPHE to see trending and maybe get to the point where they could reduce the manual reporting requirements uh, of the hospitals into EM resource so they could go less frequently. And in any case, to try and provide some context and redundancy for the, that manual entry system. So the way we thought about this project from the beginning and still do is that the bed availability dashboard is strategic and EM resources tactical. So that, that description is, you know, the MVP for the COVID-19 incident. Uh, next slide, please. Just to give you a flavor of how kind of busy the EM resource screen is, this was taken a number of months ago, the screenshot. Um, but I mean, this is, uh, this is kind of what you get for counting things manually. And depending on where you were in the incident or whatever, by my estimation, a facility could be manually entering between 50 and 150 data elements uh, each day. Um, what's key here for understanding how these systems were designed from our standpoint is that the black bars represent regional arrangements. And so that's how this kind of visualization is set up of the state data. Next slide, please. So this is a Tableau dashboard that we built. Uh, and, and so this is on our platform. There's Okta access. And so this is what the uh, 50 uh, healthcare coalition member organizations are using to look at. And the only real thing to comment on here, I mean, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, is that it can be sorted by those regions. And so it could be put in a browser tab, uh, literally next to the EM resource um, display and sort of, again, be used to provide context back and forth. Um, 
so the the other thing that's probably worth uh, mentioning here before we flip on is that uh, you know kind of what you see is what you get um, is that the no changes sense line up there in the header um, is actually available in the live version of this for every data point uh, for every facility, if you hover over it as a tool tip. And so it does allow a little bit better understanding than just sort of this being a static file in terms of if you're trying, you know, if there's a variable you really care about, kind of about how much movement is happening uh, within that variable. Um, next slide, please. So the other way we have of looking at the data, and this is, uh, I don't think is um, quite in production yet, but um, this is a live mock screenshot of a live mock-up of what uh, one of the views might look like in the North Central All Hazards Regions um, GIS Situation Awareness Viewer. And obviously all of you have enough experience with these kinds of systems as you can imagine what other kinds of data might be interesting to look at displayed around this uh, hospital work and these kind of metrics. So um, next slide, please. So where does this leave us? Um, basically, we know we have data problems and we still have a lot of trouble getting with the data senders, the hospital systems, because they're still really busy, a little less busy, to try and correct um, various kinds of problems and, and, and tune these, this system. Um, so that's what we're trying to do now. We also, in the near future, would like to put the eight additional have uh, bed types in um, so that we would sort of have the full kind of uh, public health emergency preparedness picture. Um, we would like to uh, also have an understanding um, about what happens when, say, medical surgical bed types are moved to uh, ICU bed types for the purposes of the disaster. So there's been some thinking about that. And we have a lot of other data on our platform that would be useful, we think, to display um, and provide context for these. So not just how many ICU beds are occupied, but how many ICU beds are occupied by someone who is known positive for COVID-19. Um, we think the counting methodology we use to do this on these messages actually might apply to other kinds of resources like ventilators, which is sort of be the holy grail. Uh, that'll be a big lift, but we have done some work on it. And obviously, at the end of the day, uh, we want to get this to the point where um, it's reliable enough and accurate enough, uh, and, and you know, it's obviously standards compliant, uh, that it can push these data and other systems to reduce the manual reporting load, whether that's a state EM resource system or whether that's something like the CDC's bed counting systems. So I'll look forward to hearing the questions and um, I think most things I talked about are also linked out in this presentation for when you finally get that. Ezekiel, thank you so much for the presentation on that. I know this was an issue that uh, many of our community members dealt with throughout the uh, COVID-19 response. So it was really, I think, beneficial for folks to see how you can get some automated data feeds from across those hospital systems and how that can be aggregated and rolled up. Um, it's a really interesting model. And I, I think especially given the advent of some of these interoperable data standards with um, HAVE, HAVE and others, it really helps to kind of foster that uh, integration as well as aggregation of that data is needed to help ease some of the reporting uh, needs. So thank you very much, uh, Zeke, I appreciate that. We don't have a lot of time, we are actually running short, but I did wanna take a moment and ask our participants, um, you know, and get some feedback from you all. Is your agency connecting to hospital data systems to automate health medical data reporting? So if you can take a moment and jump onto the Mentimeter and answer the question, that would be really beneficial, I think, to our collective efforts um, and, and as we close out today, I, I had additional questions, but we're going to keep it short. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions to our, our, our panelists that are with us today, as well as to our participants around, you know, what are you all doing uh, to ensure that the capabilities and solutions that you've shared today that were, you know, should we say innovated during an event, how are you working to set those up and get those pre-staged for future incidents or you know, future flare-ups of COVID or other pandemics? Um, so I'd just like to take a moment and um, you know, I'll go back to our keynote. Uh, Christopher Shields, if you're still with us, would you be able to share some insight in terms of what you and your agency is doing um, with regards to that? Well, I guess one of the challenges is planning when you're in the middle of the fight. 
Um, there are a lot of things that we learned from the pre-planning assumptions to the systems that have been built or are being utilized now. They're going into the parking lot, more or less, of when we do our pandemic review. So we'll end up having two AARs, phase one and phase two responses. So the stuff that's in the parking lot for phase one will get incorporated into the rewrite early and then the stuff that we're going to wait for the vaccine campaign to roll out to ensure that what we assumed would happen and the innovations that we have in place did happen or worked effectively would then be rewritten into the, the next update. Interesting. Thank you very much, Christopher, for those insights. Um, and I'm curious, to, you know, I'll, if Daniel uh, Stolb is still with us in, in the state of Oregon, um, what are you doing, at, you know, within Oregon to ensure some of what you, you stood up in, in COVID, you know, is pre-staged to and or being incorporated into your pandemic plans, et cetera? Yeah, so as far as uh, getting things set up for the next go around, all of the solutions that we built and employed are actually housed on our main agency, ArcGIS Online account. So we have designated GIS users that are then able to access that account and make copies of those dashboards, copies of those stories so that we can wash, rinse, and repeat there. Uh, there are a couple of components on the back end uh, involving some SQL queries that uh, we'll be replicating for future events uh, based upon kind of our unique identifiers that we have for tracking incident data. But overall, I mean, it's, it's a written document that we're gonna be employing into our SOG standard operating guides uh, for moving forward and incorporated into our ESF-5 planning uh, SOG plan. Great, thank you so much, Daniel. And I did wanna check in with FEMA Region 1, you know, Melissa, Jeff, or Ben, you know, you, you all obviously developed some pretty incredible data analytical models that you readily use during COVID. Um, how are you currently looking to extend the usage of that type of work, um, either in the continuation of COVID or for future incidents? Hi, this is John Garrett with FEMA Region 1. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you, John. Hi there. So, so Melissa had to drop off um, at 3.30. Um, I just want to check if Ben or Jeff were on the line, but otherwise I'm happy to answer that. And yep. it doesn't... It looks like they had to drop off, yes. Okay. Yep. So yeah, so basically we are at the present moment um, looking to, I would say expand our scope in, in the sense that we're trying to um, coordinate with recovery elements. We were initially stood up specifically for response. Um, this is unlike most disasters, you know, I'll say a hurricane where an incident happens and then uh, you, you kind of transition into recovery. This is, um, this is unique and so um, we're, we're engaged with long-term recovery elements to identify ways that we could support um, their efforts. We're also internally within um, Region 1, we are basically the, uh, a, a reference source for our decision makers when it comes to return to work decision making. Um, there's a lot of guidance that's been issued uh, by our agency and um, we'll obviously have to take in regional considerations into account. So that's one component. Um, and then, you know, I know Jeff had met mentioned the evacuation support tool. That's something that we're actually, you know, working to expand our relationship with our state partners. So, you know, a lot of these um, started out as concepts that are being actualized and, um, you know, to be in a position for delivery, um, you know, planning amidst crisis, of course, as was referenced is, uh, is a challenge, but we, we wanna be positioned uh, to support both response and recovery elements uh, and be a flexible resource at the region. Great, thank you so much, John. It's very, mm -hmm. I, it's very helpful to kind of understand where you're gonna be taking a lot of this work and, and where it's going. So in the essence of time, um, I'll just mention a couple of things. So we really encourage all of our participants to uh, complete the, uh, the questionnaire and feedback form. This is a critical way that we're gaining some quantitative data to inform the AAR process and the improvement plan. So it takes about eight to 10 minutes. Um, it is anonymous and, uh, and really to help get the word out and encourage your uh, networks and colleagues to participate in that as well. Um, it's one feedback form per person as opposed to per agency. Uh, and we did want to mention that we do have our prep response community portal, which is a publicly available portal. 
Um, we encourage you to share resources directly within that portal re regarding, it can be about COVID, other incidents, as well as preparedness resources as well. So that is an open um, forum for that. Um, and with that, we have uh, concluded today's session and uh, we've run out of time for today. Keep an eye out for our future and upcoming events on our website. And then if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me as well as to Molly Shar uh, with NISJIC. And uh, thank you everyone for participating today. And thank you very much to our panelists and our speakers today. Uh, we really appreciate the time and expertise that you lent and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Have a great afternoon.